Well, I want to greet you on this Boxing Sunday morning in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad for each of you that have chosen to tune in this morning. I'm certain that you were busy celebrating yesterday, but I'm glad that you decided to, even though you might be tired, and even though you might have eaten a bit too much and be suffering from that point of view, I'm glad that you've decided to make the time to tune in this morning. So yesterday we celebrated the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, it's, it's such a wonderful time of the year for all of us. In fact, the entire world celebrates the birth of Jesus Christ. Regardless of their belief systems, it almost seems like the world unites when it comes to Christmas time. And today I want to talk to you about a subject entitled, Given to Us. Given to Us. And so today uh, on this Boxing Sunday, I hope that you are going to be blessed and challenged by the Word of God. Given to Us. And that comes straight out of the book of John, chapter 3, and verse number 16. And for those of you that don't know, I mean, you know, I grew up in a time when this portion of Scripture... Uh, we had to learn it off by heart as a Sunday school memory verse. And I hope that our children in this generation are also learning scriptures from the Bible. If you aren't, I would encourage you to make the time as parents and even as the children to learn vital scriptures. Scriptures that are important for you to carry through your life. And certainly the book of John chapter 3 verse number 16 is one such verse. It says, For God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. What a wonderful portion of Scripture. And that's where I get my title from, Given to Us. But the Bible just doesn't start off with giving. The Bible starts off with God and His love. And not just His love for the people that loved Him back, but the love for the world. You know, you and I, we are positioned to love those that love us. We are positioned to love those that are close to us those that are a part of our lives. That's our position in life. That's how we operate in life. We don't just love people we don't know. We don't just love people that are strangers to us, but certainly those that are close to us and certainly those that love us back, we love them. But you know, God's different. This was a time when the world didn't really love God. The world would, had gone off in a tangent, similar to where we are right now, actually, where the world is going off in a crazy tangent. They go off in every direction that God has told us not to go. They break every law of God, left, right, and center, all because of apparently grace, which I don't believe they understand completely. And so... God's love for us is not based on where we are. It's not based on how we feel about God. It's not based on whether we are saved or not. It's not even based on whether we serve Him or not. The Bible says, for God so loved the world. And you know, this love caused Him to do something. It caused Him to give us His only begotten Son. He gave because He loved. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of, of how I interact with my children. My children, they benefit from the stuff that I give them because I love them. They benefit from the stuff that my wife gives them because she loves them. In fact, I also benefit from the stuff my wife gives me because she loves me and vice versa. And so there is a love that I understand, but more specifically toward my children because my children don't often listen to what I say. But you know what? They still receive out of my life, they still receive out of what I have because I love them. Because I love them. And so, love without giving isn't love, is it? The Bible teaches us that if we love, we ought to give. We ought to give. 
You can't say to your wife you love her, but forget to celebrate your anniversary. Forget to celebrate the important things. In fact, forget to celebrate even day-to-day -day living. You can't say to your husband that you love him either if you don't take the time to celebrate. And in order to celebrate, you're going to have to give. And so God gave us His only begotten Son. He gave. You know, if God did not give, you and I would not have celebrated Christmas yesterday. There would be nothing to celebrate. There would be nothing for the world to recognize. There would be no day that has been put aside for celebration worldwide. And so God in giving has allowed you and I to celebrate yesterday. Without the gift that God gave, we wouldn't have exchanged gifts yesterday. But God positioned to give. He gave us His only begotten Son. And you know, that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting thing. You and I benefit because God gave. But you know, we have this gift in our hands. But when God chose to give, He didn't just give it straight to you and I. He gave it through an individual. And today that's what I want to look at very quickly. He gave it to us. He gave Jesus Christ to us. But He gave Jesus Christ through somebody. And you know, you and I, we sit as people that have received this gift of Jesus Christ. But if it were not for one individual that had positioned herself in a time and in a place many years ago, you and I would not be able to receive Jesus. Because when God looked to give Jesus, you know, He didn't just give Jesus directly to the earth. When we look at John 3, 16, it's the headline of what God had done. But within the headline of what God had done, there are details that you and I need to consider. And those details are found in the book of Luke chapter 1 from verses 26 through to 38. You can go and read it. But it talks to us about a woman called Mary. And this woman was a virgin. She had kept herself pure. The world these days does not consider keeping yourself holy, keeping yourself pure. But here's a woman many, many years ago who the Bible talks about as a virgin. She, the Bible takes the time to say that she was a virgin. Now, there are two reasons why the Bible does that. The first reason is for you and I, the ones that read the Bible today, because you and I have slipped into a place where we don't keep ourselves anymore. We don't care about purity. In fact, forget about keeping yourself for your husband or your wife. These days, you can choose to do whatever you want. You can choose to become whoever you want. But here's a time that the Bible talks about where a woman had chosen to keep herself pure, keep herself holy. But the second one was also to maybe announce to us that it was a time when people weren't keeping themselves pure. It was a time when people weren't keeping themselves holy. And so the Bible takes the time to announce that she is a virgin because there was possibly a lack of virgins at the time. And so she's a virgin. Not only is she a virgin, the Bible says that she is highly favored. She is highly favored and that she is blessed among all women. Now that's quite an introduction to this woman. You know, the world talks about favor and even churches talk about favor and we've taken favor and we've made it a thing that God never wanted it to be. We've made it all about money. We've made it all about accumulation of wealth. We've made it all about accolades on the earth. We've made it all about title, ownership, and all of these type of things. I'm not saying that those are bad things. But what I am saying is when the Bible spoke about a woman that was highly favored, this woman, it doesn't talk about her having a lot of money. I'm not saying she was poor, but it doesn't talk about a bank balance. It talks about a lifestyle that she's chosen. The Bible says that she was a virgin. Highly favored, blessed among all women, Mary. 
You know, when we talk about it these days, all we can do is talk about all of the stuff that doesn't matter, all of the things that die on the earth, all of the things that perish on the earth. But God, when He's looking from heaven, when God's looking to bestow favor on somebody, He finds this woman. The Bible says the angel of God, it's the angel Gabriel, and so God just doesn't send just any angel. He sends the archangel Gabriel himself to go and talk to Mary about what he wants to do. But he starts off by saying to her, and this is found in verse number 28, in case you're wondering, he says to her, rejoice. And you know, I find that interesting because here's a woman that is highly favored of God. Here's a woman that is blessed among all the women on the earth. But the angel starts off with a very important reminder. Rejoice. Rejoice. In fact, you could call that an instruction. Rejoice. And you know, I find myself having to remind people of God all the time how they ought to rejoice. You know, we get caught up in places and situations and circumstances where we don't rejoice. But here's a woman, she's highly favored of God. Heaven is shining down over her life. But the angel starts off with an important reminder. Rejoice. How many times do you and I need to be reminded about rejoicing? But here's a woman, even as set apart as she is on the earth, there's a reminder to rejoice. I believe it's a reminder that you and I need to receive. Within the details of life, within the circumstances of life, even now at the end, as we get to the end of 2021, as we look now after celebrating Christmas yesterday, as we start to position ourselves to welcome in a new year, 2022, can you rejoice? Rejoice. The Bible goes on to tell her about why she ought to rejoice. And the Bible says that she's going to receive a child. It's going to be the Son of God. And she takes the time to ask, but how is this possible because I've not known a man? And the angel says to her, this child that you're going to receive, God is going to come and hover over you. His spirit is going to saturate your life. And you will be with child as a result of God himself coming over your life. You are going to conceive a child because of a supernatural move of God over your life. My word. How's that? I don't know whether you need the supernatural in your life. I don't know whether you are positioning yourself for stuff that is going to come at you next year. And you're wondering how you're going to do it. You're wondering how's it going to happen. Well, I want you to be like Mary. Not try and manufacture something. Not try and seek it out. But understand how God will do it. Allow God Himself to reign over your life. Allow God Himself to come over your life and allow God to conceive something in you. Allow God to do what cannot be done by anybody else. You know, the Bible tells us that Mary is still a virgin even at the time of Christ being born. And that is significant. She has waited on God. God has done a supernatural work in her life. And what is impossible is to have a baby born and you are still a virgin. But here's what happens with Mary. Here's what happens with Mary. There are two verses that I want to read out to you this morning. It's verse 32 and 33. And I read those two out specifically in order to give us context about what I want to talk to you about a little bit further. The Bible says, verse number 32, the angel speaking to Mary, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Now, you know, I read to you the book of John chapter 3, verse number 16. It says, for God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. It's God's son. But you know what? He's linked to a man called David. You see, Mary is a descendant of David. And so when God's looking to do something on the earth, as supernatural as he is, and as supernatural as it needs to be, 
He will always use men and women on the earth to deliver the supernatural. And he will even still give them credit for them being available because it is God's only begotten son. But here the Bible says that he's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. And so God recognizes the involvement of Mary, not only the involvement of Mary, but the involvement of a man called David, who many, many, many years ago had failed God miserably and made some decisions that had caused him to go off in a tangent, caused him to do some unspeakable things with a woman called Bathsheba, resulting in murder, cover-ups and all types of things. But because of the grace of God back then, God's only begotten son, when he's on the earth, when he's moving on the earth, when he came and he was given to us, you and I, he's not sitting on the throne on high when God gave him. The Bible tells me he's sitting on the throne of his father, David. I like that position. I'll tell you why. Because that position is not infallible, but that position is a fallible position. It's not the throne of God that he's sitting on when God's talking about what he wants to do on the earth but he's sitting on the throne of a man called David. If he said he's sitting on the throne of God, that's a totally different situation because the throne of God is infallible. The throne of God is something else altogether. But when God sent his only begotten son, he lets him sit on a seat that is fallible in order to do what is infallible. In order to do the supernatural, he makes his son take a seat on an earthly seat, on an earthly platform. He even gives recognition to David as a parent of this child of his also. You know what? I've come to understand that when God wants to do something on the earth, he understands that he's got to change his position from infallible to fallible, from a place of where nothing can touch the throne room of God. No enemy can attack the throne room of God, but here we have God shifting his status, shifting the status of his son, putting his son on the throne of David, on the throne of David. And you know, as surprising as that is, there's a bit more that surprises me more. The Bible says that he will reign on the house of Jacob forever. My goodness. If you know the man called Jacob, you know why I find that surprising. Jacob was a man that had many issues in life. He had failed God miserably. He had done many things all in the name of a promise that his mother had received from an angel. My goodness. His mother received a promise from God about Jacob being the leader of his home, even though it was not the natural position. The natural position of leadership was given to the eldest son of the house. Jacob is not the eldest. He's a twin brother to the eldest. His brother Esau is older than he is by a few moments, but still older. But the Bible tells me that God had given a message via an angel to the mother of Jacob, saying that your son is going to be the leader. Your son is going to be the one that I am giving my promise to. And when she receives that promise, she starts to manipulate the promise. She starts to try to work the promise. I want to talk to people of God here this morning. In the year coming, the year 2022, I'm saying to you, don't work the promise. Allow God to work the promise. Because when you start to work the promise, you're going to corrupt the promise. Allow God to work the promise in your life. And so Jacob goes off in a tangent. He becomes a corn artist. He steals from his brother. He becomes a liar, a deceiver. He goes on to do many things. He even gets deceived by his own father-in-law for many years but he gets to a place a moment in time when he decides to cross his family over he's on his own and the bible says that god wrestled with him that night and god shifted things that he couldn't shift god changed things that he couldn't change god removed that 
manipulative spirit. God removed that corn artist spirit. And as God leaves him, God says to him, you will no longer be called Jacob, but you will be called Israel. And you know what I find interesting? Out of Israel comes this big nation. Out of the man that God had changed from Jacob to Israel comes out this holy nation of God. But you know when God sends his only begotten son to rule on the earth, he doesn't send him to rule over Israel forever. The Bible is specific. I mean, you ought to underline the book of Luke chapter 1, verse number 33. The Bible says that he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Jacob is not changed. Jacob is a man fighting for change. Jacob is a man struggling with real issues. Jacob is a man that has a promise from God. He's trying to get to the promise. He's not at the place of receiving the promise yet. He's not received the promise. Israel is the man that received the promise. Jacob is before receiving the promise. But God, when he brought his son into the earth, he didn't bring him to rule over the house of Israel. One that has received the promise. One that has come over issues. One that has already overcome challenges and obstacles of life. But God, when he gave his only begotten son, he gave him to rule and reign over people that are still struggling with issues. People that still have problems. People that are still Jacob. The house of Jacob, the house of a deceiver, the house of a manipulator, the house of abuse, the house of corruption, the house of disease. The Bible says, this is God's word, not mine. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And you know what? All of a sudden I start to feel a bit more comfortable because I realize that in my pursuit of the promise, I'm still a work in progress. I'm trying. I'm trying to become better, but there are times and moments where things come into my life that cause me to go off in a tangent. It causes me to not be grabbing a hold of the throne room of God. I'm looking for answers on the earth. I'm trying to solve problems on the earth. I'm trying to achieve on the earth. But God says, this is what His Word says. He gave His Son to sit on the throne of his father David. He makes David his father on the earth. He makes David his father on the earth. A man that had such great things happening in his life as a child. As a child, he killed Goliath. As a man, he killed another man because he fell in love with his wife. From victory to failure, he sits on that throne. A throne that is fallible. And from that throne, he reigns over the house of Jacob. I believe that's you and I. I believe that's you and I who are trying. You and I who are trying to get to better places. You and I that are trying to make our lives better. You and I that have real issues on the earth. You and I. I need to go back to our key text. So he gave his son to us but he gave him through a woman called Mary he gave him to the throne of David and he gave him to rule over the house of Jacob forever I like that I like that but you know what he could never take the throne of David he could never rule over the house of Jacob if it were not for Mary who allowed God to give to her as well as through her. The Bible says that whoever believes in Him. You know what? Receiving the gift of Jesus Christ is significant. It is so significant that the entire world yesterday celebrated the gift that is Jesus Christ. But you know, within the entire world, there are very few that activate the gift that they've been given. You see, you can have the gift, but never actually received the gift. You can only receive the gift through something called belief in Him. Belief in the gift. 
believing in Jesus Christ. You know, all of us celebrated yesterday. You know, I like the way we celebrate Christmas. I'm not going to deny it. They pull out all the stops. They do whatever needs to be done to celebrate Christmas. We have families that ignore each other every day. But on Christmas Day, we make the calls we don't make on other days. And that's all okay. That's all okay. I'm not condemning that. We take the time to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. We're saying, be joyful. Rejoice because Christ has come. Wonderful. But you know Christ coming in itself is meaningless without this particular type of person, as the old King James Version would say, whosoever. The new King James Version says whoever. Whoever believes in him. You see, it's not the ones that have received. It's not the ones that had the party yesterday. It's not the ones that celebrated yesterday. But it's the ones that believe. Whoever believes in him. Hey, you know what? How many of us celebrated the occasion yesterday? And today we don't believe. Today we have a headache because we overindulged. And those are bad things, you know. The Bible says that a drunkard will never enter the kingdom of God. So take that as a mild rebuke here from this pulpit this morning. If you were one of those that overindulged yesterday. The Bible's specific. It says a drunkard will never enter the kingdom of God. We got so caught up in celebrating Christ. We've lost track in a belief in Christ. You see, believing in Him is different from receiving Him. Believing in Him is a different position. It's a different position. Because as I struggle with real issues in my life, as I go through a life's journey where I encounter issues, real issues, where I encounter sickness, where I encounter disease, where I encounter things I cannot change, where I encounter a change in my financial position, where I encounter all types of issues with all of these things that I encounter every day my belief in Christ is challenged I can't deny that it gets challenged when I look around and I see what's happening you see there are things in my life that I'm trying to change there are issues that I have that I'm trying to change I know the promises of God for my life I understand the promises of God for my life I understand that the Bible tells me that by his stripes we are healed but yet I have sickness in my own home I have disease in my own home I understand that he's called me to live a certain type of lifestyle but there are issues that we face where we worried about things. We worried about the lifestyle. We worried about all of these things. And it causes me to be challenged about my belief. But you know what? I'm encouraged by what the Bible says. And that's why I took the time to read it out to you. God's not sent His Son to reign over Israel. The man that had received. The man that had overcome. But God sent His Son to reign over Jacob and the house hold of Jacob forever and that talks to me about men and women that are in the trenches of life that talks to me about men and women that are stuck in issues of life where the last thing they're actually thinking about is believing in Jesus and that's the truth let's be honest we're thinking about how are our bills going to get paid we're thinking about this year I've been unemployed this year I suffered next year how's it going to work and so we have all these issues of life clouding our sight of Christ. But that's why the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. Yay, yay, yay. But let me tell you, it's a challenging place. My belief in Jesus gets challenged every moment of the day. Every moment of the day. But you know what happens? There stirs in me this ability to shut my eyes to the sickness at home to shut my eyes to financial issues and challenges to shut my eyes to circumstances of oppression in our country to shut my eyes to failures in our economy failures in government but to open my eyes to the promise of God and to allow that promise just like Mary did my goodness come on now to allow that promise just like Mary did to manifest through God coming over my life through his Holy Spirit descending over my life the Bible says whoever believes in him whoever believes in him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. The Bible there tells me that there are two gateways. Two gateways on the earth. One gateway is the one that leads you into a place where you will perish. And the other gateway is the one that will take you to a place of eternal life. Two gateways. Without a belief in Jesus Christ, by default, one gateway is open. The one gateway that's opened by default because of the lack of a belief in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, one gateway is currently opened in your life. And that gateway is the gateway of perishing. Perishing. So you have that gateway open. It's open. Whether you like it or not, it's open. But when you start to believe in Jesus, over the disease, over the sickness, over financial issues, over challenges, over issues in your marriage, over issues in your home, over issues with your children. When you start to believe in Jesus, what that does is it shuts the gate of perishing and it opens up the gate of eternal life. You know, the only thing that can open the gate of eternal life, even Jesus Christ himself, Coming into the earth does not open the gate of eternal life. Jesus Christ coming into the earth provides the gate to eternal life. But what opens the gate to eternal life is your choice. Your choice to believe in the gift that you've celebrated yesterday. To believe in Jesus Christ. Can you change your position? Can you change from celebrating the gift to believing in the gift? Can you change from decorating and all of the wonderful things we've done to celebrate the gift? Can we change our position to believing the gift? Believing in the gift. You know when you believe in the gift, the Bible says to me in the book of John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse number 14 of chapter 1 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. And you know what that tells me? Jesus Christ Himself is the Word. Let me tell you something, how you start to believe in Jesus. Activate the Word. Activate the Word in your life. Open up the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Understand the Word of God. Jesus Christ Himself was the Word crucified. I told you already, you walk by faith and not by sight. Well, let me tell you how faith comes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The more of God's Word you hear, the more you believe in Jesus Christ. The Bible says to me, two gateways are opened. Which gateway are you choosing by default? Which gateway are you going into without realizing it? We have been given the gift. We, the gift is given to us. There's no doubt about that. But do we believe in the gift we've been given? You see, the Bible tells me in the book of Matthew chapter 5, and reading from verses 14 through to 16, there's a difference between the person that receives the gift only and the person that believes in the gift they received. Let me tell you about it. The Bible says in verse number 14, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse number 15, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You see the difference between receiving the gift and allowing the gift to be given through you? Those that allow the gift to be given through you, you are the light of the world. There's a difference with that light of the world. Many of us are focused on our works being the light of the world. I want you to know your works are not the light of the world. Your works are not getting people saved. Your works in the world are not getting people saved. But the light of the world which is in you, you are the light of the world. If you let your light shine 
people will see the works of your hands. People will see how God has done things in your life. People will see how God has taken you as Jacob. How God has made you the Israel. How God has taken you out of this place of obscurity and brought you into a, a place of His magnificent light. How God has done the work in your life. People will be able to see it. You know what the Bible says here? The Bible doesn't say that you'll testify about your good works. The Bible says that the light that shines allows people to see your good works. You know what it makes me wonder about? As the people of Harbor Lights Tabernacle, I know very well that God has blessed this house. God has prospered this house. I know this well. And I know that the world looks at how God has blessed you. I know that the world looks at how God has done things in your life. They look at how God has blessed you so much because even during this time, they don't see you walking around depressed and oppressed, but they see God providing in your life. And so they see how God has blessed you. They've seen the work of your hands. But you know what I'm challenged by? People are able to engage you about your wealth. People are able to engage you about how did you buy the house? How did you buy the car? How come you got the promotion? But people don't see the light of Jesus. You know why? Because they fixated on what you present to them. We've gotten to a place as the body of Christ where all that is presented is prosperity. Where all that is presented is God wants to bless your finances. Where all that is presented about the kingdom is you walking in abundance. But you know what? It's time we change that people of God. Don't let people fixate on your car. Don't let people fixate on your home. Don't let fi people fixate on your business, on your career, how God has taken you and blessed you, how God has given you the accolades you've received in university or at school. Don't let people fixate on that, but allow them to see the light of God. You see what the difference is? We are people that receive the gift but never allow the gift to be given through us. We present to people a Hong Kong gospel. We present to people a corrupt gospel where it's all about the bling, where it's all about the flashy lights, where it's all about the size of the stage. People of God, I'm talking to you. Let 2022 be a year where people are not focusing on your wealth, People are not focusing on your money. People are not focusing on your accolades. But they're focusing on Jesus Christ. Because you, like Mary, allowing the gift to be conceived in you. Allowing the gift to grow in you. Allowing Jesus to take over every part of your life. And allowing Jesus to shine to the earth. You know what is sad? I see more men receiving glory. I see more women on the earth receiving glory for what's happening on the earth. I see pastors, I see bishops, I see prophets, evangelists receiving glory. But Jesus, where is Jesus? Is he still under the Christmas tree? Is he an open present but not used, not believed in? This morning, you can have all of the benefits of receiving Jesus as the gift. You can have your circumstances change. You can have increase in wealth, increase in living, increase in every area of your life. But Jesus has not been presented to the unbelievers at your workplace. Jesus has not been presented to your unbelieving family members. Jesus isn't there. They see your money, but they don't see Jesus. They see the homes that you live in, they don't see Jesus. But in this year coming, in fact, from this moment, can you take the gift that has been given to us and allow it like Mary to be presented to the earth? The only way to present it to the earth is to allow Jesus to take over every aspect of your life. Serve Him with everything that you have. Believe in Jesus with everything that you have. Even when you receive a doctor's report that is gloomy. Even when you receive your bank statement and you look at it and you wonder, how am I going to make it work? Even when you receive letters that are threatening possible retrenchments, whatever the case might be, believe in Jesus. Even when the fuel price is escalating every month, 
It's going crazy. Believe in Jesus. Even when you hear the whispers of more looting, the whispers of more uprising, the whispers of more insurrection, believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus. He's the gift that's been given to us and He's the gift that needs to be deposited into the rest of the world. He's the gift that needs to be given to your family. He's the gift that needs to be given to your neighbors. He's the gift that needs to be given to your colleagues at work. Believe in Jesus. He's been given to us. But like Mary, as much as we've received Him, can He be given through us? This morning, on this Boxing Day morning of 2021, let it be the moment in time where the gift of Jesus Christ got given through you. Can you be like Mary and find yourself more favored than anybody on the planet because the gift of Jesus is being given through you? Not money, not increase in, in, in mammon, not increase in wealth, increase in Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? If you felt that the Word of God spoke to you today, I'm asking you to just extend your hand, wherever you might be. You could be even watching this morning from the beach. You could be sitting in a hotel somewhere. You could be at your holiday apartment. You could be at home, wherever you might be. Extend your hand and allow the gift that has been given to you to grow inside of you to such an extent and to such a place where it is given to others. Father, this morning I thank you. I thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ. I thank you so much for you giving us your only begotten Son. But Father, this morning we are reminded and Father, this morning we are encouraged not to focus on just receiving, but focus on allowing Jesus to be given through our lives. Allowing Jesus to be deposited into others. Allow Jesus to rule and reign over the houses of Jacob. In our environments, in our homes, in our businesses, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our universities, in the taxis, in the buses. Father, in our communities, allow Jesus to rule and reign. Rule and reign, rule and reign. Father, I pray for a divine shifting within the kingdom of God where our position changes from accumulation of wealth to accumulation of souls, from accumulation of an earthly harvest of money and increase in abundance to an eternal harvest of souls, I pray. Father, I pray that this gift that you gave us called Jesus Christ be given through us. I pray for opportunities. I pray for real moments with our families that don't believe, with our friends that don't believe, with our neighbors that don't believe. I pray for real moments where we are able to give Jesus through us. Allow Jesus to manifest his promise. Allow Jesus to work it out. I pray, Father, that even the people that have received, I pray for a belief in Jesus that is unshakable. Yes, we find ourselves in the places of Jacob. Yes, we find ourselves in the places that Jacob found himself in. But Father, I pray, I pray that the Word of God over every circumstance, a belief in Jesus over a belief in everything we see, And so, Father, I pray, I pray that the year 2021 and Boxing Day 2021 forever be etched in our minds as the moment when we genuinely, genuinely shifted from believing everything we hear and see to believing in Jesus and Jesus alone. I pray for a real blessing over everyone that's listening this morning. I pray for the favor of heaven, this divine favor that surpasses all the things that we focus on. 
divine favor be our portion divine favor be our portion let heaven visit us let heaven descend upon us let God himself descend over our situations over our homes in Jesus mighty name and father I pray for the ability to carry what you deposited in our lives this morning we've conceived something here here today I pray for the ability to carry it full term I pray for the ability to deliver what we carry I pray father for the strength to even impart it to others in Jesus name we pray it and all of God's people said amen well, I want to thank you this morning for waking up. I mean, I know that it must have been a challenge for many of you to drag yourselves out of bed this morning. And I thank you for being patient and listening all the way to the end. As you can see, yes, the Christmas tree was out. Uh, it's unfortunate that we couldn't be here to celebrate yesterday. Remember, it's all about Jesus. It's not about this tree. The tree without Jesus is meaningless. It's all about Jesus. And so I want you to remember that as you continue to celebrate during the days ahead and as you get ready to usher in a new year. Remember, it's all about our King, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Take care.